Ed Ward is on the line. Ed's going to be at Miami Book Fair International next Saturday at noon, and he's going to be there representing his latest work, The History of Rock and Roll, Volume 2, 1964 to 1977, a follow-up from his History of Rock and Roll, Volume 1. And Ed Ward, welcome to WLRN and Folk and Acoustic Music. Thank you. Nice to be here. First of all, it's it was such a pleasure to read these volumes. It it seems like the definitive book on rock and roll. Is this is this your is was this your masterpiece? Well, so far, I mean, I have other things I want to do. I want to finish this story and get on to uh, something else. The book starts. The volume two starts uh, with the Beatles coming to America in 1964. It came at a time you uh, right when America was recovering from the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy just a few months after that. Did that have any... Yeah, that's, that's a somewhat simplistic reading of, of uh, the zeitgeist at the time. America was, was really, you know, going through a lot of different crises, you know, from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the assassination to um, the Civil Rights Movement. And it was a, a nation in turmoil, and the uh, popular music of the day wasn't really expressing it all that well. What was expressing it was folk music. And um, so, but that wasn't getting played on the radio. That wasn't, you know, a dominant popular form. So w- these aliens, literally aliens from, you know, another country that nobody ever thought about. I mean, you know, come on, England? That was like, does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? That's what England gave us. What was it about England? Why did they like Chuck Berry and Little Richard and and they didn't take hold here in America? Wait, they didn't? No, well, the Beatles were so influenced by early rock and roll. Why why didn't America experience that that evolvement? It it did. Then why it's did the... just that it was it was tamped down. See, Popular music in America has always been at least somewhat at the mercy of commercial forces in the music business. And from the very beginning, rock and roll was was um, minimized by those people. It was only weird independent labels like Chess, which was a, uh, a blues label run by Polish immigrants in Chicago, that, that were able to uh, take advantage of this. And so Chuck Berry, his records came out on chess. And they obviously made it over to England, and and uh, and the Beatles played their music. Well, yeah, the the um, there was a very important record label, um, London London Records in in the um, in England that initially licensed records from anybody they could. And they they released them. It became sort of a thing in England for kids to search out this blue and silver record label because you never knew what would be on it. They they you know they they licensed they licensed Little Richard among others. So you know there there was gold hiding in those grooves for hip teenagers like John Lennon. You could go down to the record store and pick up a record out of the rack and ask to have it played. And there was little booths in the back, and you could sit there, and there were headphones, you put them on, and you, you could hear these records. Just a few years older than John Lennon and the musicians were the producers, George Martin, and uh, they were kids as well. And uh, the Beatles and the music wouldn't have been as popular as ones for the producers. How important were they in the the popularity of the music well all all kinds of peripheral people in in the music business were were uh, extremely important i mean george martin cut his teeth on the goon show which was a radio show uh featuring comedians like spike milligan and, and peter sellers and uh, john lennon listened to that growing up because it was wacky and zany it was the the monty python of its day among the things you could hear if you were a British record buyer, you could hear Jimmy Page, who was a teenager and owned a fairly good electric guitar and was 
a pretty good player and who listened to this, the sounds coming from America and reproduced them backing up British singers. So you could have, you know, you just have studio musicians playing behind the singer, but the guitar, which was pushed into the forefront, was played by an actual teenager, Jimmy Page. When they when the Beatles came to America, it was still teeny bopper music. It, it wasn't as if rock and roll was the was the uh, con, what what it is today. When did rock and roll change from teeny bopper music to to adult music? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure that's a, a useful division. Uh-huh. Um, there was um, a point where. Uh, the music industry began to focus on pre-made idols, people they could control. You know, Frankie Avalon was very definitely a product of his management and um, his producer and didn't really have much say in what he was playing. When did that change? When did the artist well, start that, to take... That basically, that, Partially that changed with the Beatles, but also partially it remained um, that there was a a part of the the music business that retained the wildness and and the freedom, and that was black music. I mean, we shouldn't forget that, you know, Motown started back in the 50s uh, as a company, and that, that people knew about this stuff, and it was, it was sort of an underground. Ditto folk music, you know, for, for another subset of, of record buyers. There, there, were, there were people who, who were listening to this stuff and, and forming ideas of what they wanted to listen to. There, after the Beatles, a number of folk musicians started exploring ideas beyond folk music. Um, almost every one of the important San Francisco musicians began in folk music. Um, bands like the Love and Spoonful were made up 100% of ex-folkies. I'm speaking with Ed Ward. His new book, The History of Rock and Roll, is volume two, uh, is just out. And Ed will be at Miami Book Fair International for a talk uh, along with Jim Daniels and Evelyn McDonald next Saturday at noon at room 803 on the campus of uh, Miami-Dade College downtown. San Francisco, uh, you mentioned they were how much folk music was uh, important. What was the main difference between East Coast and West Coast? San Francisco, Grateful Dead, and... There was seemed to be well, a real difference between the two. Well, for one thing, um, on the East Coast, performance opportunities were, were very much constrained. The, um, New York had a lively show business tradition, but it also had the uh, cabaret laws, which delimited how much, uh, you, how much could be, you know, what you could do in a club that served alcohol. And um, if you lost your cabaret card, you couldn't perform in any place that served alcohol at all. Uh, A number of jazz musicians' careers were negatively affected by that. Um, And rock and roll performers, well, to begin with, a lot of the audience for rock and roll was under 18. 18 was the drinking age in New York. And so in one of the huge media capitals of America, there was no development of rock and roll. Now, there was some for the older teenagers with folk music, and you could go to places like the Cafe of Gogo or or, um, the Village Gate and hear folk performers at special shows where alcohol wasn't served. But um, in terms of you know, what we think of today where you can go to a club and, and uh, just see bands, <laughs> that wasn't happening in New York at that point. So the, the music that came up was very, very um, narrowly folk music, whereas on, on the West Coast, electric music was didn't have this kind of, you know, 
aura of shame to it. And a lot of folkies use electric instruments to back them up. I, th- I thought you were going to mention more about the LSD that was uh, prevalent on the West Coast. Was it also uh, prevalent on the East Coast? Uh, yeah, ever hear of Timothy Leary? Uh, well, that's also too. Allen Ginsberg is, plays a big part in early rock and roll as well. Well, I don't know as as directly he did, but he he was for the sort of social change that was going on in rock and roll at the time. Ed Ward is on the line. His new book is called The History of Rock and Roll, Volume 2. You worked uh, at Broadside Magazine, didn't you? No. I had a, uh, a woman, I was going to college, in college in Ohio, we, we would take a car and drive to New York for the weekend. I had a girlfriend in Princeton that I could go uh, see and stay with. Um, but I was writing these, these things for... Uh, for broadside and I thought, oh, instead of mailing it in, I'll just I'll just go over to the office. So this woman, Bobby <laughs> Fox, who who was um Robert Crumb's girlfriend, which is a whole other part of the story. Anyway, she said, Oh, Broadside I'd like I'd really like to meet them. So we went up to the um the apartment that the uh, family that ran the magazine lived in and um I rang the doorbell and Gordon Friesen came to the door and he says, Everybody has the flu. I said, well, here, here's my uh, manuscript that I I was going to turn in. He goes, oh, thank you very much. A- a- and uh, Bobby said, Mr. Friesen, do you know Bob Dylan? And, and Friesen looked, and he, he shook his head, and he says, I wish Bobby would just write a good song about Vietnam. That's... And Bobby Fox looked at him and said, but Mr. Friesen, they're all about Vietnam. And I think in that moment, I became aware of what later became known as the Generation Gap. Broadside Magazine did some really radical music. They were communists. They make no bones about it. Sisson Gordon wrote a co-autobiography. Uh, I can't find it at the moment. I'm looking at the bookshelf. But um, they made it very clear that they were members of the Communist Party and that Gordon's main job was infiltrating trade unions, labor unions, and that the reason they shut down Broadside was that the party transferred him to Detroit. Not thinking. I mean, the typical Communist Party USA thinking, they never. it never occurred to them they were probably doing better for the party by staying in New York and, and doing this radical folk song magazine. Wow, that you know, that's kind of scary when you say that. I didn't realize the Communist Party had such uh, influence so late in the, uh, in the in in time. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the folk uh, idols were involved with either communist or fellow traveler activities, you know, the Almanac singers and, and all of that, that was, that was, you know, Woody Guthrie for that matter. Um, Sis uh, Cunningham makes a point in, in this book that um, there was a sort of native socialism that grew out of the farmers movement in Oklahoma, which is where she grew up and where Woody Guthrie grew up and, and that the communist party seized on the opportunity to exploit that. They weren't as big of a threat as we made them out to be, are they? Or were they? No, they weren't at all. It was, they were, I mean, nobody who was a thinking communist in the 30s stuck with the party after Stalin. Because he was an idiot, and they knew that. They, They saw where it was going. It was that it was not much different from what Hitler was doing in Germany. Well, the Friedsons, they did stick with the Communist Party, as did yeah, with Paul did. Robeson as well, I suppose. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people... Well, the people who were doing well behind the, the their communist affiliation, you know, stuck with it as, as long as they could. 
and Pete Seeger uh, couldn't shake it. You know, well, I, I, I don't know whether Pete was actually a communist or a fellow traveler. I mean, it, it got he was an idealist, which was his problem. It, it was hard for him to shake his idealism. Well, he's uh, he outlived it. Yeah, well, he outlived the party. Yeah. He did not live his idealism. No, that's Thank true. Thank God. Amazing. It's amazing that he, he held held on to that. He yeah. had the circumstances to um, to keep on thinking like that. So he was lucky. He was uh, well, and he had a yeah. uh, uh, Toshi who was uh, who turned out to be good. Yeah, and he also had his his little ecosystem there in Beacon, where he was watching. His idealism at work, you know, watching the, the Hudson River get cleaned up and stuff like that. Ed Ward is on the phone. He's going to be at Miami Book Fair International next Saturday at noon. His new book is called The History of Rock and Roll, Volume 2. Ed, you worked at Crawdaddy Magazine and Rolling Stone Magazine. Rolling Stone became the premier rock and roll magazine, yet Crawdaddy predated that magazine. Why did Rolling Stone become so popular? Well, mostly because Paul Williams, who founded Crawdaddy, didn't really understand how to make it bigger. And um, he was much more of a fan than he was a businessman. He lost control of the title early on, and uh, what came out as Crawdaddy after about oh, I don't know, 1969 or 1970 was a whole nother thing. The um, Rolling Stone was founded by somebody with very clear goals. How important so, was that in the development of rock, of rock and roll? Well, initially, it was a rock and roll magazine you could take seriously, which Crawdaddy was too, but Crawdaddy was uh, looking too much at the sort of Boston school of Harvard intellectuals who had great explanations for everything based in stuff they'd learned at school. And and, um, Rolling Stone was much more open to people who were fans, just as long as they could write. I mean, don't forget that in its early years – Rolling Stone was uh, the, the managing editor of Rolling Stone was a guy named John Burks, who uh, Jan Wenner, the editor publisher, had wooed away from uh, being the uh, San Francisco stringer for Newsweek. So he had a hard news background, and um, that I mean, people ask me if I went to journalism school, and my answer to that is yes, John Burks, <laughs> because I learned so much just from interacting with him in the office, how to, how to make a story happen, you know, how, how to have verifiable sources, stuff like that, you know, that, that none of that was going on in, in the, you know, the, the early rock press, except at Rolling Stone. We had a real newsroom, we had correspondence, and we had fact-checking. Ed Ward is on the line. When did you decide you wanted to be a journalist? Or, and rather, did you ever want to be a musician? No, I, I, I guess I wanted to be a musician, but I soon discovered I had no talent. <laughs> um, and uh, the world is a better place for this. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't want to become a journalist so much as I wanted to be a writer. Uh, and uh, that dates back to early childhood. Um, we had a, a book, we had lots of books in the house, and I saw one that was called Confessions of an English Opium Eater, a guy named Thomas De Quincey. And I remember asking my dad, I said, you know, what did Thomas De Quincey do? He said, well, he wrote a book called Confessions of an English Opium Eater. I said, yeah, but who was he? He says, he was the guy who wrote a book. I thought, wow, that's a really interesting way to, you know, survive the centuries. And all he did was eat something. I had no idea what opium was. So um, I thought, maybe that's something I want to do. And I discovered I did have a talent for that. I, I 
could write stuff and, and people would read it. So I pursued that. I'm sorry. Great idea was to become a novelist, but you know that, that pays even less than journalism. One of your books, Michael Bloomfield, The Rise and Fall of an American Guitar Hero. Who is Michael Bloomfield and why is he not more well known? Well, um, Michael Bloomfield was a um, he was a, a, a guitar player, basically, uh, but he, he grew up in Chicago. And uh, so he had access to all the great Chicago blues um, in the 1950s. Uh, and then, but he, he was like a white Jewish guy and fell into a crowd of other white people who, uh, who were playing the music of their environment, Chicago. And uh, he uh, became the lead guitarist in, in Paul Butterfield's blues band and attracted a huge amount of attention from the folky crowd because they issued their first record on Electro Records, which was a folky label, and then, you know, appeared at the Newport Folk Festival to the scandal of everybody. And they blew people away. They were really... He was really good. They were really good. And when he left... The Butterfield Band. He um, had a pretty chaotic career. I mean, everybody has heard Michael playing because he backed up Bob Dylan on, uh, well, like a Rolling Stone, and on the Highway 61 Revisited album. Why did Michael Bloomfield not want to be Bob Dylan's guitar player? Because he really didn't like being in public. He was this masterful guitarist who would have been very happy doing nothing but recording. He didn't, I mean, he played out a lot, and um, yet it wasn't something that made him feel like he had to do it. He, he, uh, he, uh, he talked to me one time about not having the desire to become a beloved performer, he said, you know, that that's El Elton John. If Elton John couldn't perform, he'd die. He'd wither away. He just couldn't stand it. You know, or, or Tony Fields, who had a leg amputated and was in Las Vegas a week later with one leg still singing and, and doing her shtick. He says, I, I lack that gene. I'm just as happy staying home. Edward is on the line. His History of Rock and Roll, Volume 2, is his latest. He'll be at the Miami Book Fair International next Saturday afternoon uh, for a talk at 12 noon in room 8302. Your book, The History of Rock and Roll, Volume 2, uh, I think it's a dedication to Margaret Moser, 1954 to 2017. She lived right. it. Who Who is yeah. Margaret Moser? When I got to Austin, one of the things they told me was there was so much music out there that I could um, use freelancers to augment what I was writing. So um, I mentioned that in one of my early columns, and I asked for you know people to send me clips and then come in and talk. And um, they were all guys, of course, but there was this one woman named Margaret Moser. So she, her clips were, were really good. And they were from a, uh, a uh, now dead or dead then too underground paper uh, called the Austin Sun. But Margaret had, had done a gossip column and uh, features for the Sun, and they were all well done. So I asked her to come in, and I talked to her, and I gave her an assignment, and she completed it. So... Margaret appeared in the Daily Paper, and suddenly I was besieged by all these musicians who went, don't you know who she is? She's a groupie. I thought, well, she can also write. And that's, that's what I'm after, you know. And um, we became really good friends. She, she hustled around the, the music scene, and uh, so some of it was the groupie thing, and some of it was more being the grand dame of Austin music. And um, she 
wound up always doing something public. Um, and one of those things was when South by Southwest started, she uh, organized the Austin Music Awards around the uh, Austin Chronicle, which is the uh, month, uh, the weekly free paper here. And she developed that in, into a genuine event. Every year, the Austin Music Awards, who was going to win best this or best that? And she'd have performers, top performers play live for this thing. And it, it was really important. And I I moved to um, to Europe for 20 years. And when I came back six years ago, Margaret was no longer in Austin, which was shocking. But like many musicians and other creative people here, she'd been priced out. So she was living in Manchac, and then she moved to uh, San Antonio. Uh, she had I, I knew that she'd been diagnosed with uh, with cancer, but, and it really got worse after she moved to San Antonio, by which time she'd married a friend of mine, you know, Steve. And uh, so I went down there a couple of times and talked to her. She was not able to get up or walk around or anything. But I thought, no, wait a minute. Here is a woman who lost her virginity to Steve Winwood when he was 16 and she was 13, and he was touring with the Spencer Davis group. And, you know, she's always sort of been there. Uh, and her history goes back that far. Spencer Davis, you know, to post-punk. So oh, she obviously had to uh, had to be the dedicatee. She had the one I dedicated it to. Have you ever been disappointed by an artist after you interview them? Probably. I mean, you got to realize I was I was at the Daily Paper here for five years, and um, I had to do um, two columns and two features a week plus uh, concert reviews. That was the minimum requirement. So it was a job. Was, these were just people that we had to call up. You know, one day I'm sitting in my cubicle and John and Yoko walk by. And they're just people. Well, it's easy for you to say that. You you see these people. Well, no. I mean, a big, big mistake, and I'm going to cover this in the third book, was that Rolling Stone sort of decreed that gods walk among us and that anybody who was a beetle or a stone was different from us in the same way that a god is different from a mortal. And I, I reject that because it really takes away the importance of the audience in forming the art, that, that the Beatles were their audience. Um, even more important, Dick Dale and the Deltones were just a bunch of surfers who had electric guitars. Uh, they, they're incredibly important in terms of being the audience is on stage. It's just that the guys on stage have guitars and we don't. And uh, it, later on in the history, uh, punk will make that uh, make that claim again and, and make it work. But that runs counter to the control actor of, of the uh, of the labels and the producers and the publishers and all the people in the music industry you, you, they want to control what they're putting out a and uh, that runs contrary to what rock and roll is all about you're kind of making the case that rock and roll is folk music yes it is Ed Ward will be at the Miami Book Fair International next Saturday at noon on a panel starting at 12 o'clock in room 8302. 
Ed, thank you so much for taking time to talking to us.